If you've been following along, we spent the last two videos basically doing math, and we're not talking about basic arithmetic. While being good at math may have played a part in our choosing to study engineering, most of us are not into math for math's sake. We certainly appreciate the beauty of mathematics. I mean, mathematics is amazing. Stopping there, however, would be kind of like admiring a hammer. We could certainly do that, but the real beauty of a hammer is displayed when we use it to hit something. The math we have been talking about is complex arithmetic, and we developed the idea of a phaser. Complex numbers are numbers that involve the square root of negative one, which we refer to as the imaginary number, represented by the letter J. It turns out the imaginary number is not imaginary in the way we normally think of imaginary. It is only because of Descartes that we have it named such. Imaginary numbers are necessary to solve a large number of actual physical problems. A lot of wave equations that we deal with require are complex numbers for their solutions. It also turns out that our generalized cosine is just the real part of a complex sinusoid. The so-called imaginary number is as important as zero is to engineering and science, or negative numbers to national budgets. The term imaginary is just another unfortunate historical decision with which we have to bear. The phaser is a way in which we describe the sinusoidal function in terms of a magnitude and a phase angle. A phaser is a complex number rotating at an angular frequency of omega on a complex plane. Normally, we freeze, that is stop, the phasers and look at them at a particular point in time so that we can more easily compare phasers in the same system. All that being said, let's apply these concepts to our energy storage devices, the capacitor and the inductor. Let's jump right into the equations. A generalized time-dependent voltage can be written as the real part of a complex sinusoid, as can a generalized time-dependent current. If we substitute these into Ohm's law, we get the real part of the voltage will be equal to the resistance times the real part of the current. We can take the complex sinusoids and separate them into exponentials representing the phase and an exponential representing the angular frequency. The first part of each of these functions, which is the magnitude and the phase, is what we refer to as the phasor. So we have the phasor of the voltage and the phasor of the current in the equation. Since the resistance is entirely real, it does not matter if it's on the inside or the outside of the real operator. We can then factor out the exponential function and apply the real operator to the whole equation at once. This equation can only be true if the inside of the real operator is equal to zero, and what we are left with is Ohm's law in phasor form. Now this is not an earth-shattering equation by any means. We know that resistors do not store energy and therefore only affect the magnitude of the voltage or current. I think it's always easier to run through the steps of a process when I know what the result's going to be before I try to apply it to something new. So now let's look at the current voltage relationship for a capacitor. We know the current through a capacitor is equal to the capacitance times the derivative of the voltage across the capacitor. If the voltage across a capacitor is a generalized cosine function written as the real part of a complex sinusoid, the derivative of the voltage is going to be the derivative of the exponential function. The derivative of the exponential function always gives us the function back. However, in this case, since there is a function in the argument, we have to take the derivative of that also, which will leave us with a factor of j times the angular frequency. We have the voltage across the capacitor, the current through the capacitor, and the current voltage relationship for the capacitor which involves the derivative of the voltage across the capacitor. Putting them together, we get the real part of the current is equal to the real part of J times the angular frequency times the capacitance times the voltage. If we separate the sum that is in the exponent, we can write this equation in terms of the phasor current and the phasor voltage. From our exercise with the resistors, we know this will result in the phasor current being equal to J times the angular frequency times the capacitance times the phasor voltage. Rearranging this to look more like a traditional expression of Ohm's law, we have some quantity times current is equal to voltage. That quantity has to be at least analogous to resistance. In fact, we call this the impedance of the capacitor. Whereas resistance was a measure of how well a component resisted the flow of electricity, impedance is a measure of how well the component impedes the flow of electricity. Alright, so they're synonyms. 
Just like resistance, impedance is a ratio of voltage to current. In this case, however, it is the ratio of the phasor voltage to the phasor current. Impedance has units of ohms. A couple of observations that we can make about the impedance of a capacitor are that it is complex. 1 over j times the angular frequency times the capacitance we can write as minus j over the angular frequency times the capacitance, which is a complex number with a real part of zero. So in polar form, we can write 1 over the angular frequency times the capacitance e to the minus j 90 degrees. That means the current and the voltage waveforms will be 90 degrees out of phase for a capacitor. The current will lead the voltage. We also know as the angular frequency decreases, the impedance increases. The extreme of this would be the angular frequency approaching zero, which is basically DC, and then the impedance becomes infinite. Alternatively, as the angular frequency goes to infinity, the impedance of a capacitor goes to zero. This is similar behavior to what we saw when we looked at the differential current voltage relationship for the capacitor. Capacitors block DC, that is an infinite impedance, and if we try to change the voltage across the capacitor rapidly, we get enormous currents. Well, what about inductors? We know that the voltage across an inductor is proportional to the inductance times the derivative of the current with respect to time. If we substitute the generalized exponential form of the current and take the derivative, the result is j times the angular frequency times the current. If we rearrange the current to a more convenient form and substitute that back into Ohm's law, we see that we have the phasor voltage would be equal to the complex number times the angular frequency times the inductance times the phasor current. So we have a quantity quantity ZL equals J times angular frequency times the inductance, and we will call that the impedance of an inductor. The impedance of an inductor is a ratio of the phasor voltage to the phasor current, and is equal to J times the angular frequency times the inductance. It has units of ohms, and can be expressed in either rectangular or polar form. In polar form, we see that the impedance will cause the voltage and current to be 90 degrees out of phase. In this case, the voltage leads the current. We also see that as the angular frequency increases, the impedance increases, and as the angular frequency decreases, the impedance decreases. This is exactly the behavior we would expect if we think back to the differential relationship for the current through an inductor. The faster we try to change the current through it, the larger the voltage we would get across it. That corresponds to a large impedance. As the angular frequency decreases, we see the impedance drops also. That is consistent with the fact that inductors appear as wires to DC signals. So now we have two quantities to describe capacitors and inductors in circuits. It's important to remember that impedance only applies for circuits under sinusoidal steady state conditions. That means the circuit has only constant sinusoidal sources of the same angular frequency. What does this do for us? The biggest thing that it does for us is it takes our differential relationships for current and voltage that exist with capacitors and inductors and turns them back into linear equations. That means all of the circuit analysis techniques we have learned for DC circuits still work. Everything from combining resistors to voltage and current division to superposition all the way up to mesh current and node voltage analysis, and that an equivalence can be used in the phasor domain. Of course, we probably do not want to start by solving a 7x7 system of equations with complex coefficients. While I'm sure we could do it if we set our minds to it, it's probably better to start with a few baby steps. A simple place to start might be combining impedances. With that in mind, let's start with a time domain circuit. Here we have a circuit powered by a sinusoidal source that contains capacitors an inductor, and a resistor. In this form, all of the components in the circuit have dimensions that are different. There is not much we could do to the circuit to simplify it. But let's say that we're interested in knowing the equivalent impedance seen by the voltage source. The circuit has one source, and that is a cosine wave with an angular frequency of 50 kiloradians per second. Now, since there is a single angular frequency in the circuit, we can convert it to the phasor domain. We will do this by converting each component to the phasor domain. Though it is not entirely relevant to the the problem, we will put the voltage source into the phasor domain for practice. Since it is a cosine form, all we need to do is take the magnitude of 15 and the phase angle, which is 0 degrees. That leaves us with 15 e to the j 0 degrees volts. As we change these quantities from the time domain to the phasor domain, the quantities that are in the phasor domain are going to appear highlighted in orange. It is important to keep the domain separate. We should do everything we can to make sure it's clear which quantities are time domain quantities and which quantities are phasor domain 
main quantities. Looking at the 0.47 microfarad capacitor, the impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J times the angular frequency times the capacitance. With an angular frequency of 50 kiloradians per second, that will give us an impedance of negative J 425.5 ohms. Moving on to the 8.7 millihenry inductor, the impedance of an inductor is J times the angular frequency times the inductance. That would give us an impedance of J times 435 ohms. The impedance of a resistor is simply its resistance. So the value of the 3 kilo ohm resistor does not change in the phasor domain. We might have some indication of that since it already has the same units as the other quantities. The 22 nanofarad capacitance will become minus J 909 ohms using the same formula as we did for the other capacitor. Now the circuits in the phasor domain. The entire background has changed to orange to indicate this. We are interested in the equivalent impedance seen by the voltage source. So let's begin by removing the voltage source and indicating the quantity we are looking for. As I said before, all of our analysis techniques that apply to resistive DC circuits now apply to our resistive capacitive and inductive circuits in the phasor domain. That means that impedances combine exactly like resistances. The 3 kilo ohm and the minus J909 ohm impedances are in series. We combine them by simply adding them. The resulting component has both characteristics of a resistor and a capacitor. So when the circuit is redrawn, the component will be represented by an arbitrary box. Next, we might notice that the two components on the right-hand side of the circuit are in parallel. Parallel impedances combine just like parallel resistors, so we add the reciprocals together. That gives us an equivalent impedance of 61.5 plus J 444.7 ohms. Lastly, we will combine impedances in series, resulting in an impedance of 61.5 plus J 19.2 ohms. There are a few interesting things we can note at this point. First, because the impedances can be both positive and negative, sometimes the imaginary components of an impedance can decrease when combined in series. Another thing that we might have noticed is that the imaginary component of the impedance is positive. A positive impedance indicates an inductive property. So in the end, the circuit has a resistive and an inductive characteristic. This is not something we normally do, but if we were to redraw the circuit in the time domain, we would replace the voltage source as it was. The resistive component of the impedance would remain the same, and the equivalent of the inductance can be determined by taking the magnitude of the complex portion of the impedance and dividing by the angular frequency. This gives us an equivalent inductance of 0.384 millihenries. That brings up at least one more thing that we should talk about before we leave the introduction of impedances. An impedance can have a real and an imaginary component. There is a vocabulary and a notation that goes with this. Z is the letter used to represent impedance. The real portion of that represented by the letter R is the resistance, and the magnitude of the imaginary component is represented by the letter X and is called the reactance. We can also look at the reciprocal of the impedance, which is called the admittance. The admittance would be written Y equals G plus JB and has units of Siemens. So Y represents the admittance. The letter G is the real part of the admittance and is called the conductance. The letter B is the magnitude of the imaginary component of the admittance and is called the susceptance. We have impedance, which is equal to resistance plus the imaginary number times reactance, and we have admittance, which is equal to conductance plus the imaginary number times susceptance. And from what we previously knew, we know that admittance is 1 over the impedance. This is a little less straightforward than resistance and conductance, however. When we take the reciprocal of an impedance, we are taking the reciprocal of a whole complex number. We cannot simply take the reciprocal of each of the components. That would be a huge mathematical error. Since we are working in variables, I think it's much easier to stay in rectangular form. To perform division in rectangular form, we use a complex conjugate to clean up the denominator. So multiplying the admittance by 1 in the form of the complex conjugate over the complex conjugate, we get the resistance minus J times the reactance over the resistance squared plus the reactance squared. If we separate this into real and imaginary components, we see the conductance is equal to the resistance over the resistance squared plus the reactance squared, and the susceptance is equal to the negative reactance over the resistance squared plus the reactance squared. Do not make this classic mistake. Switching between impedance and admittance is slightly more involved than switching between resistance and conductance. It is straightforward and becomes a simple task with practice. To review, the quantity of impedance was defined as a ratio of phasor voltage to phasor current, and is valid for sinusoidal steady state circuits. It has units of ohms. The impedance of a capacitor is 1 over J times the angular frequency times the capacitance. The impedance of an inductor is J times the angular frequency times the inductance. Impedances are the complex version of resistances and are treated just like resistances in circuit
circuit analysis. The reciprocal of impedance is admittance, and it has units of Siemens. Impedances and admittances allow us to analyze circuits that contain sinusoidal steady state sources using the circuit analysis techniques that we already know. That's all for today. Go out and make it a great one.